these words from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount are very familiar to us. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Last Tuesday would have been the 114th birthday of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. You may be familiar with that name. If not, let me share with you that in his native Germany, Bonhoeffer was a star student who earned a doctorate in theology at the ripe old age of 21. In 1930, still too young to be ordained, he traveled to New York City for some postdoctorate study at Union Seminary. According to some of his fellow students, Bonhoeffer didn't think much of Union, but he loved visiting the Abyssinian Baptist Church an historic African-American congregation in Harlem. It was there that Bonhoeffer was invited to teach Sunday school. It's there that he learned gospel music and started to think about that relationship between faith and justice. Bonhoeffer said it was at the Abyssinian Baptist Church that he began to see things, quote, from below that is, from the perspective of the oppressed. After that year in New York City, it was back to Germany and ordination. Two years later, of course, Hitler came to power, and Bonhoeffer grieved as his beloved German evangelical church got awfully cozy with Hitler and the Nazis. Just two days after Hitler was inaugurated as Chancellor, Bonhoeffer, then only 26 years old, he went on national radio to speak of the dangers of following this leader. The German authorities cut him off in the middle of his speech. He formed a dissenting group called the Confessing Church. But as more and more of his friends gave in to what he called Nazi idolatry, Bonhoeffer plunged into despair. By 1939, the situation had gotten so dire that he left Germany and came to the United States where he had been offered a teaching position at Union Seminary. If you know the story, you may recall that it was very soon after Bonhoeffer came to New York City again to teach at Union that he changed his mind, convinced that he was being a coward. So once again, he went back to Germany and began a very vocal opposition to the genocide of Jewish people taking place in his homeland. And for his faithfulness, in 1943, Bonhoeffer was arrested and imprisoned, later transferred to a concentration camp. And on April 9th, 1945, one month before Germany surrendered, he was taken by the Gestapo and was hanged. His last words to his fiancée before being led to the gallows are both haunting and beautiful. He said, this is the end. But for me, it's the beginning of life. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Around this same time, Around this time that Bonhoeffer was giving his life for his Christian convictions, on this side of the Atlantic, another follower of Christ was doing something equally prophetic. In 1942, 
After earning a Ph.D. in New Testament, Clarence Jordan moved his family to a 440-acre farm in America's Georgia. It was there that he could combine his calling to ministry with his love of agriculture. There he founded Koinonia Farm. Koinonia, of course, takes its name from the Greek word for fellowship or communion. And Jordan founded this farm to be an intentionally interracial farming community in the heart of the South. Jordan studied his Bible and believed that the kingdom of God was for everyone. So he decided that he would invite anyone to join him, black or white, women and men, to come together and live on this farm, working the land, sharing meals, raising their families, all done together in community. And Cornelia Farm is still in existence. I visited there several years ago. And incidentally, if you know much about Cornelia Farm, you'll know that it's been credited as the birthplace and spiritual ancestor of Habitat for Humanity. But back then, Jordan was under constant attack. His farm was bombed, crops were burned, the residents of Koinonia Farm were routinely beaten. But, and I find this amazing, through it all, Jordan never lost his sense of humor. I read recently that at Koinonia Farm, Jordan started a mail order pecan business. Their motto was, help us ship the nuts out of Georgia. Clarence never lost his commitment to Christ, even though many reviled him and hated him for it. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. I've told you the story before, but if it's okay with you, I need to hear it again. In my previous church, there was a dear old woman, a saint named Margaret Springfield. She lived to be 101 years old. And I guess it was about seven, maybe eight years ago, Margaret's son, Doug, was very sick at the end of his life. At a Wednesday night supper, Margaret's daughter, Peggy, came to me and said, Doug's probably not going to make it long. I know mom would like to see you. I said, Peggy, I'm so sorry to hear this. Sure, I'll, I'll go by the house tomorrow. The next day came, and, and I am ashamed to admit this, but it just slipped my mind. I forgot to go see her. I could say that I was busy. I could say that Wednesday night's really not the time to tell me something very important because I have a hundred other things on my mind. I could proclaim up and down that it was an honest mistake. But those are excuses. The truth is I just forgot. Peggy called me a couple days later and told me that Doug had died. And as soon as I heard those words, my heart dropped to the floor. Because then I remembered what I was supposed to do. I said I would go, but I didn't. I told Peggy I would go, and I forgot. I knew I needed to go see Margaret and apologize for what I had done. I knocked on the door and Margaret invited me in. She was sitting in a recliner in the living room, her eyes red with tears. I sat down on the sofa across from her 
And to say it was uncomfortable is to put it mildly. It was one of those conversations where you're not sure who's supposed to speak first. Margaret says, Daniel, you were supposed to come by, but you didn't. You said you would, but you didn't. At this point, my eyes filled with tears. After telling me of her pain, Margaret said very sternly to me, now you get over here. I thought she was going to turn me across her lap and wear me out. (laughs) But instead, she reached those bony fingers around my neck and hugged me tight. After that long embrace, I pulled back from that sweet hug and Margaret said, Daniel, God forgives me every day. I forgive you. Now help me out of this chair, she said. We're going to have lunch together. No, ma'am, I appreciate that. Hadn't planned on having lunch with you. In, In fact, I have a sandwich back at the office. Nonsense, she said. You're having lunch with me. That was that. She pulled out the linen tablecloth and said, please set the table. So I did. I heard her in the kitchen cutting butter into flour and then pouring in the buttermilk. She was making fresh biscuits for the occasion. And then I heard the ham sizzling in the pan. You are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. You know, friends, Jesus did not say, pray hard and become salt for the earth. He did not say, Grow into being light for the world. He said, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Which means, I think, the ability to illuminate this world, the capacity to bring light into darkness, it's already within you. It's who you are. You know, lighting a candle on a bright, sunny day like today, well, you know, that doesn't do a whole lot. But you light a candle in the middle of the night, ah, it shines so brightly, doesn't it? I, I wonder, maybe you do too, whether whether it's the middle of the night for our nation and our world. As I mentioned to you two weeks ago, our relationships, it it seems, are so tense these days. Every conversation we have, whether it's it's at a restaurant or in the break room at work or, or wherever, feels like Everything is so tense. And I don't know the exact causes, but I do know that our political rhetoric, the general atmosphere for us, at least to me, seems electric and not in the best way. And as I said two weeks ago, I, I'm concerned that we've gone from seeing people with different political persuasions, we've gone from seeing them as people with differing opinions, whom we respect, to, well, they're our enemies. And 
I think we need to recover that ability to talk to one another. I think we need to recover that ability to work through our differences in love. And as I say, it's permeated our relationships to a point that, and I know I'm, I'm normally an optimistic person, But in some of my relationships, it's, it's become a dark place. And we need some light. Are you willing to be the light? Because church, I think people are looking at us. Out there, people are looking at us. And I think they're wondering, is it true? Is it true that, that God could love me? Is it true that God could, could love me despite what I've done? Might there be a God who accepts me for who I am? And I think they will receive their answer. They will receive their answer that God is a God of mercy and love and grace and unconditional acceptance. When they see that God's precious family, the church, filled with people of love and mercy and grace and radical acceptance. And above all, that we are a people of light. So, beloved family, in the name of Jesus Christ, let your light shine. Let your light shine here in this magnificent sanctuary. Let your light shine in the reception after worship with your brothers and sisters. Let your light shine at work tomorrow. Let your light shine on the golf course with your friends. Let your light shine when you tuck in your children at night. Let your light shine when you speak to the waitress. Let your light shine when you shop for groceries. Everywhere you go, let that beautiful light shine. Why? Because you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world.